for those of you who are joining us now uh, and in miss the introductions, I'm Namin Aluwalia, Nutrition Monitoring Advisor for NHANES, and I'm joined by Dr. Caroline Green, Principal Deputy Director of our Center in CHS. We will be moderating, moderating the panel discussion together today. Earlier on in the plenary session, we had Anne Haynes and three invited programs describe their programs and key accomplishments. In this panel discussion part, we will be covering key themes of interest to us all, such as survey participation rates, community engagement, innovation, and funding opportunities. As you can see on the slide, we have six panelists from our three presenting programs from the plenary session. Welcome back, all panel experts. And thank you for sharing your experiences in this discussion as well. Caroline, may I begin with the first question? Yes, of course. Great, thank you. So let's talk a little bit about improving survey participation rates. Many surveys are facing low response rates in today's challenging context. What techniques or approaches can be employed to improve participant experience and reduce burden for improving participation rates? I would like to begin with Wisconsin Show Program, Drs. Jamal Matthew and Dr. Amy Schultz. Could you please describe further your efforts and what works in your experience to improve response rates? Yeah, sure. I'll I'll jump in here. Thanks. So, yeah, what we found um, for the show program to yield the highest response rates, we found it's really important to leverage multiple modalities for recruitment and to tailor them according to the study population of interest. So, for example, we found in-person, at-the-door recruitment or phone-based re recruitment has yielded the highest response rates and has been the preferred mode of contact for our rural and older populations in Wisconsin. Whereas if we look at our community advisory board, you know, they advised against at the door recruitment in black and Afri African American communities in Milwaukee and their guidance on recruiting at community events through black radio, social media, and then with trusted community leaders who then would advise on the methods they thought were best for recruitment. That really led to our success in recruiting over 500 adults and over 100 children in African American and Black communities in Milwaukee in less than two years. So I think it's it's, it's being open to different modalities and really being open to tailoring them accordingly. For participant burden, we've done a few different things, but I think one thing that's been um, really important to highlight here would be tracking our recruitment attempts and for every participant in a database. So every participant's in a database, tracking, were they recruited for this study, yes or no? Did they respond to the recruitment, yes or no? And then did they participate, yes or no? So that when we get an investigator that comes in and says, I'd like to follow up older women over the age of 50 that live in rural areas, we can query that and look to see, have they been invited in the past year, in the past two years, for how many studies what were they on and assess if it's a good time to recruit for another one. And then in terms of retention, I think one thing that's really important in addition to regular and consistent data give back via newsletters and the like that Jamal touched on is it's really important for us to signify and establish a long-term relationship via personal touches that don't have a research agenda. So for example, we send annual birthday cards to participants, we send holiday cards to community partners, and even in our data give back, we're reminding them of the value, the impact that participation has on statewide policies, on health discoveries, on scientific innovations, and they feel part of a important family. So I'll hand it over to the next um, panel. member. So I think it, the, the answer to that question is not simple. It depends on if you're cold recruiting or if you're engaging a cohort that you've already, um, that you're already working with. If you're cold recruiting, um, that also has two, I'll give you two different answers to that. If you're if you're cold recruiting in an area where you don't have any community support, then you need some kind of compensation or trinkets or something to get their attention. 
um, with a letter so that they open the letter. You know, you want something in there that's going to have them open the letter so that they'll respond if you're going to later call them or ask them to follow up on something. Uh, if you're cold or recruiting and you have community involvement, that's a huge plus because that the community buzz, the, the known and trusted community members, depending on your community, it can be a variety of people, whether it's faith-based leaders, schools, local influencers, athletes. Um, we've had a lot of luck with social media. It, there are lots of different ways you can get that kind of known buzz uh, for the cold recruiting. When you're talking about the cohort you've already recruited and trying to deploy surveys on people that you've already talked with, the most important thing is that relationship you've built um, so that you're making sure that they, they know you're coming back to them, that you'll be asking additional questions, that when you go back to them, you don't waste their time. You keep the questionnaire really brief. It's the, the hardest thing you have to do with researchers is, is work with other researchers and say, are you sure you need a 20 item questionnaire? Are you sure you can't do it in two questions? You know, is, is there any way you can pare it down because the, the more that you respect the participants' time and also compensate them, it's really important to compensate them for their time, the more likely they are, at least in our studies, to come back and, and answer questions again. Um, so, the, you know, it really depends on, on the whether it's cold or, or retained. It also is going to depend on the age. I haven't talked too much about that, but the, the way that you recruit different age groups is, is also something that, that differs. The older generation, they are still very much so with the phone. Um, but some of the younger generations, you might want to use, you know, the social media to get that buzz. Those are great ideas. Thanks you. Thank you both for sharing them. I have a follow up question. You mentioned uh, Suzanne or uh, ambassadors and we've been thinking about it. I've been thinking about it a long time for NHANES. So I'd love to hear how you find the ambassadors. How do you engage them? to really get involved and be our spokespersons. We have many, many folks join us, you know, through advanced arrangements uh, at different levels, but we not carry that like they become our ambassadors for the program. So please tell us, any of you who've had that experience, we'd love to hear more on that. So we have, um, we have ambassadors in every county that we go to, trusted uh, community partners that we've, so we go in about six months ahead of time, which actually we learned from N. Haynes when we came and talked to you all, so that we can work with community partners ahead of time, build some buzz, do events, maybe host some luncheons, work with the local rotaries um, to, to build that buzz. That's the boots on the ground. One of the things that we found because we recruited in the middle of the pandemic, um, we started learning the benefit of social media and how you can actually purchase through any of the social media platforms, the names of influencers that live in your area, especially in the younger demographic, we found purchasing the names of influencers. And, you know, these aren't like the big celebrity influencers, they're local influencers that have a local following. That was a huge help in terms of identifying those. And we, we paid them, you know, we reached out to them on social media. We said, we've got a study coming up we'd like to talk to you about. And we were wondering if you would work with us and, and be a paid ambassador. Um, so that there's a couple of different ways, depending on, you know, whether you're looking for on the ground or more that social media. That is awesome to hear. We have ambassadors from local uh, communities as well. Many, many efforts. I was just wondering if you mentioned athletes, you know, like some cool figures who can take on the baton for you. And yeah, have you had that experience and how did that go? We have. And again, think local. You know, we're not looking for LeBron James. We're looking for the an athlete that lives in Dallas or Wilcox County, may have had a year or two in the NFL, may have played college volleyball, just local athletes. The value of coaches. I can't tell you in, in rural communities, your high school football coach is going to be a major asset. So, um, you know, just knowing what that, that dynamic is and the way that sports are played. Maybe you're, you're in a big soccer county and you wanna work with the local soccer rec league coordinator. Um, so when you're thinking athletes, you wanna think really broadly uh, and in terms of the community that you're in and what type of um, athlete might help you. Mm -hmm. um, would uh, the third program like to chime in on this one, NYC, DOH, MH, mental hygiene? <laughs> Department of Health, any thoughts to share? We have time. Uh, 
Um, I don't really have anything to add to that. It, it is very important um, to have community partners to help and to build trust. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and if if we have time, just just one thing to add, because there was also a question about uh, whether we completely excluded the tribal communities in Wisconsin. Absolutely not. Our intention was not to exclude at all. In fact, we wanted to include more, and that's where our community partnerships or CABs and community leaders were extremely helpful in recruitment. And we have seen so much success in the Menominee. Uh, community uh, with the uh, with the involvement of the leaders, so that's another approach. I mean, like you know, particularly engaging the local leaders, and that's what Suzanne was also mentioning in different ways, like you know, identifying those local um, uh, leaders who can energize or catalyze the program. Sounds great. Thank you. Dennis has a comment. Yeah. In regarding um, response rates, is there, you know, you mentioned that, is, can you talk a little bit about how you change your messaging depending on which group you're trying to recruit? Um, is there ways where you talk to other certain subpopulations that the message needs to be tweaked because of their, that some of the hindrances they may have they face in, uh, to participate in our surveys? So yeah, definitely. I was going to let Amy go. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I can, I can hop on first. Yes, I think it goes along with Susan's ambassador comment. Is So similar to rural areas, we found the same thing to be true in urban Milwaukee. Um, and in particular, we hired locals that had influence. I mean, we weren't calling them influencers at the time. It wasn't as popular of a term. But... They, our cab specifically told us locals will quiz you to see if you know local knowledge. Like the cultural black community is so tight knit and they'll kind of ask you about such and such down the street. And if you don't know it, um, they're not going to participate or they're going to stop talking to you essentially. And so it's really important to have locals, um, as such, I guess, be ambassadors. You know, we didn't call them that, but they're very like involved in and they would participate and then they would advocate and recruit um, on our behalf. Uh, and they helped us with tailoring messaging and explaining things. Like they would help uh, the community advisory board and the folks we would hire from the community to help with recruitment and participation. They would do interviewing with us and, and everything. They would help tailor messages and our recruitment strategies. And they would pull out in things that just aren't gonna resonate. Like those survey questions, no one even knows, you know, what lacrosse is or like, you know, or, or they would help tailor some of the survey questions and, and how we would word things. In particular, we had to add language around sample collection and DNA um, and what we can and cannot do with that and what we plan to do and not do with that. That was a huge concern. So, yeah. Dennis, go ahead. For this, uh, there's still, Vasan wants to talk. So, Vasan, yeah, let, Suzanne, let Suzanne go first. And okay. Yeah, I, what Amy said is exactly right. The only other things that we've done differently is um, tried to change what was the priority. So if we know that for some groups, compensation is the number one priority, then we, we led with compensation. If we knew that the access to a free health exam was important, then we would lead with free health exam. Um, but again, that, that all came from our community partners. That's how we knew what, what message would resonate with which group. Yeah, thank you, Suzanne. I think the other comment I wanted to make was, I don't think we have figured it all out. There are select demographics like younger men that sometimes we say are hard to recruit. I think what that means is that we do not know how to recruit them. And that requires a different kind of approach or study and understanding what the needs are. And we are hoping to build on other sister studies that deal with that demographic and also independently work. There might be ethnographic studies or other studies you need to know to understand how you can offer something that has meaning for another group. And they will join if what you have to offer is either framed in a way it has meaning or it actually is seen as having meaning. Already taken a deep dive into the second topic, which is which is wonderful. The, the second question is really about health equity and community engagement. And we've been hearing a lot about how all of you uh, have actively engaged the community to increase participation rates, which is which is wonderful. 
Um, so I guess I'd be interested in hearing more on this topic and perhaps even about whether or not there's um, uh, an effort to engage communities even earlier in the process uh, in terms of designing studies, um, even before you're thinking about uh, participation. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it first to our, our rural study cohort representatives uh, to respond to that or to community, uh, community engagement in general and how really efforts you, you engage in to uh, reach those uh, difficult to reach populations and those that are historically underrepresented. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we really focus on that community approach, the, um, the, which starts with our community advisory board first and going to any and all meetings that they recommend, um, no matter how small, no matter how big, uh, whether it's city hall or whether it's a, a local knitting circle, you know, going and, and being present and having people see who we are and talk to us, really talking a lot about research. So the counties that we've been in for the rural study are very new to research. They, um, they've seen research on TV. And so they were thinking like, you know, randomized clinical trial, I take a drug and I get paid for it. And we had to explain, no, this is very different. We're just going to ask you questions and, and check your health status. And then we'd like to talk to you for the next few decades. Um, so that, that took a regular conversation um, going back over and over again to various groups and, and communities. It also takes, um, you know, I can share an example. One of the communities we went to, the first time I went, the community member um, did not show up at all. And so I called her back and I said, I thought we had a meeting. I'm so sorry, I might've misunderstood. And she said, oh no, no, we did. I just wasn't sure you were gonna show up, come back in a week. So I went back in a week to meet with her and um, she came, but she didn't bring anybody else. And she said, okay, I wasn't sure if you'd show up, talk to me for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. She said, okay, if you come back next week, then I'll bring other people. So it actually took me three times of going back and talking to her till I could speak with the broader community. And that's not that uncommon um, to that you might get tested a little bit and being willing to, to you know, partake in the tests and let your ego go and not expect that this is going to be business as usual. That really helps you reach communities that might not trust researchers and, and might not trust um, the medical community in general. You, you've got to show them that you're doing something different than what's been done to them before. So it, I love what you said about a longer period of time. If we had more time, that would be even better. You know, a year to build these relationships. They don't just happen. They take regular communications, remembering that their kid plays softball and ask them how the softball game went. Um, it's, it just, is, it's a lot of work that, that people don't often appreciate to, to form the relationships and then have it grow into what you were talking about before, where they might be able to inform the research as well. We haven't done that yet where the community actually informs the research, um, but it's something we're actively considering for, for future grants. Yeah, I can chime in now. Thank you, Susan. I have basically the same thing to say. So I think we're all in agreement. Um, we've had similar experiences and similar to what Carolyn was saying. So we've learned over the last seven years, as many of you have also, the other panelists, that it takes dedicated time and resources to build and maintain relationships with the community. And I've as a consultant with other researchers that went to leverage our cohort and, and conduct research with us and within our with our partners, and it is so important that that's what is communicated to new researchers that want to collaborate. That research is not the community's top priority, and so it requires not only approaching with patience and humility, but really building in that time into your approach. So engaging the communities early, I encourage them to do it prior to the grant writing process. When they come to me and the grant's already been written and they have ideas, they say, you can't use our cohort to do this then because these are precious partnerships we've established. Um, and so really ensuring extra time is built into our study and grant timelines and then building in the community restraints and community delays, like expect delays and responses, expect delays in communication and then build that into your approach rather than expecting the community to make any changes on their end. So I think that's something that we don't often do as researchers. Another thing I wanted to mention that often gets, I think, overlooked or we don't talk about as much is how we're prioritizing diversity, equity, and inclusion within our organization. Because as 
leaders of an organization, it has a trickle down effect into all the work we do. And we're so focused on making sure that the cohort's diverse, which is very important. But um, we, for an example, established a dedicated committee of staff to DEI, where they attended regular meetings with the sole agenda to evaluate, research, suggest, and implement DEI in every aspect of the program. So looking at the staff, representation in all our meetings, our, our survey questions, inclusive, do we have DEI as part of our hiring process and our interview questions? You know, we have a neighborhood survey question for someone that lives 20 miles from any other person or neighbor, and they have a hard time grasping what that means, and we've gotten feedback on that. Let's come up with a solution, implement a change. So um, we've definitely implemented some more systemic uh, DE&I within the organization that then has trickled on effects in terms of making sure who we hire values, equity and inclusion, and they can provide examples of how they've done that in their work. So that's another thing that we've done as well. Carolyn, I think you're muted. Uh -huh, please. Yeah, all right. For some, please, sorry. yes, please add one, one comment and then we'll move on to the next question. We can yeah. keep talking about I just wanted to add that one of the things we have learned in rural is that it takes much more time and far greater resources because the community doesn't follow the timetable of a grant that is funded. You know, for them, it's time that they need to build a trusting relationship. So we always need more time. And that's one of the struggles researchers have. What they're very wary of is helicopter research or mosquito research. You come in, you take a tube of blood, you fly off, and you leave a blob there for them, and they have bad memories of the researchers. So that's an internal struggle, and we're trying to calibrate within rural as to what's the sweet spot, because there is a timeline for studies. I think that's a very, very good, important point. We could all use more time with our potential participants as early as we can make contact. Great takeaway. Thank you all. So that brings us to the new theme we would love to talk a little bit more about and a priority for all of us nowadays, innovation, keeping up with times that are changing, keeping up with technology and methodologies and advances that keep on occurring. How do we keep up with, with you know, constantly evolve, evolving variables, phone apps, they beat us to our standard precise methods and really, and he struggles with that because we have a job to the nation. You know, this is not a quick surveillance or like screening thing, which maybe, are we really ready for these? That's what I like to hear from. So we stick with our precise and standardized methods. So I know many of you have begun to use some of these measures and it'd be great to hear from you how you are modernizing your content, whether it's exam, lab, or questions. And also, as we expand, how do we modernize while expanding to address social determinants of health? Um, uh, let's see which program wants to go first. Um, show? Sure, maybe I can take that. So we, we, we are trying to incorporate more technology number four, for the reason that it's much cheaper uh, to, to administer a, a survey through electronic means than in-person contact. But what we have also learned is, you know, a lot of our population don't even have emails. So, um, so in that setting, it's very important to balance it. Otherwise we'll be extremely biasing the cohort, which we don't want to do and, and reduce the participation. Another thing is language. So, uh, you know, we, 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 we need to make sure that, for example, we need to have Spanish surveys or, you know, uh, so how do we administer these? What, what language do we provide is another question. So we are trying to see, um, you know, we're trying to see if we can group the participants or type of participants into several groups, very technology savvy people, like the youngsters. I mean, they probably don't want to talk and they want to enter something through electronic means. So we might leverage the electronic tools there and then, uh, you know, ultimately we will have a group of people who would want to stick with uh, paper-based surveys and in-person surveys. So we'll be entertaining that too. Um, I can add that in New York, 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, in New York, we've pretty much transitioned completely to a push to web invitation. Um, so we are still sending out paper invitations, but we're not sending them to all of our cohort members. We use sort of an algorithm based off of age um, and other demographic characteristics to determine who we think are likely to um, want to receive a physical invitation. Otherwise, uh, our cohort members will only receive invitations to individual surveys through email and text. Um, and we encourage all of those participation participants to take the survey online. Um, we do recognize that some of our participants don't have access to a web portal to do that that way. And so we are offering the phone interview as an option. Um, uh, and then we're also offering multiple languages. So I think Sharon mentioned we offer surveys in English, Spanish, Russian, simplified, and um, traditional Chinese um, so that we're trying to I guess, expand our options um, for all of our survey participants to respond. Um, the other thing that I think we're trying to do to sort of innovate, although not from a tech perspective, is to really adjust some of our questions um, to be reflective of sort of like hot topic issues. Um, so we recently conducted one of our health opinion polls and that included questions um, about the air quality that was um, very poor in New York City over the summer and how people responded to that and what their behaviors were like and what specific actions they took um, to stay safe during that period. Um, we also conducted an annual social determinants of health survey um, and include social determinants of health questions on a lot of our surveys. Um, so these are you know, related to general and mental health, different um, issues related to healthcare access and insurance material hardships. Um, we have a fairly um, extensive line of questioning on um, interaction with uh, law enforcement professionals, um, incarceration, and we look at employment and, and other more sort of um, standard social determinants of health in these surveys as well. Those are very, very nice thoughts. And uh, we have a few minutes if uh... I think we haven't heard yet from Ruru. Uh, I can I can share a little bit and Joa and Susan can build. I think rural it doesn't have the challenge Enhance has because we are allowed to innovate. Uh, you know our data, and we have a last mile problem. Uh, I think the reason studies like rural are not done because they're not easy to do. So you got to take the science to the people. You got to put in, and what rural does is we have the fastest CT scanner in the country, for example, fitted into a mobile examination unit. We have artificial intelligence-based echo because you don't need a sonographer. A technician can get cardiac images. We have a mobile lab laboratory that uses AI technology to get complete blood counts because we don't have a lab to which we can send the samples the same day. So I think right out of the gate, we innovated and we see ourselves as a learning organization. Let's try something. Let's keep monitoring what is working and adapt as we go along. We did start off the gate prioritizing social determinants of health from the get-go, because I think that is the essence of rural. So we had a whole committee, we had a questionnaire committee, we you know, spent quite some time about the initial two years of rural we spent with a design, designing MEU committee, where we designed the mobile examination unit, knowing well that none of our investigators had the expertise to design a mobile examination unit. We had a questionnaire committee where we bandied around the various questionnaires, looking at the various sources, and then making sure that it will work, especially in a, in, in a demographic where there is a lot of adversity. And how do you how do you administer such a question? What should be in the MEU? What can be in a smartphone? We gave our participants, as part of the study, we study funds a smartphone and a six month data plan because really we can't expect participants to answer using their own air time. So I think some of these we have built into rural, but I'll stop here and I have Suzanne add anything to this. No, I think that's a great summary of what we've been doing. Hmm. That's awesome. And we will follow up with you on AI that you mentioned. We are all interested to learn more about it and how we can and incorporate potentially such things. So thank you for those wonderful insights. And uh, Caroline has another question. Yes, so I, I, our last formal question for this panel discussion uh, is one that I think all of us are extremely interested in. 
and that is funding opportunities. I think we all know that multi-mode health surveys are very expensive and we are always trying to collect more data, release data more quickly, uh, and this is even more expensive. So I'd like to ask our panelists um, what uh, ways they found, innovative ways, to identify and secure uh, funding sources. Uh, and we'll begin with representatives from show. Sure, I can take that. Funding is easy. You can get infinite <laughs> sources of funding, <laughs> I wish. So, so the big, biggest challenge is, I mean, we were extremely lucky that we had the Wisconsin Partnership Program funding show for a long time, but, um, and, and we are reaching at, at, at an age and time where there is a lot of emphasis on real world data, particularly with the FDA coming out with the real world guidelines. Because in early times of show, if we look at the usage patterns from researchers of this data, a lot of it was used by epidemiology researchers because they, they can relate to it much, much better. But somehow the real world evidence has put an interest for all other kinds of clinical and translational research and clinicians who are interested in doing community-based research in leveraging these resources. So we are now um, you know, getting written into many grants that are going out. So that's, that's one extra source of funding that we are trying to like build. And then um, you know, specific innovations in pursuing federal grants, obviously. Uh, the other third category is uh, because, again, because of the real world evidence and FDA guidelines, industry is very interested now in leveraging some of this, particularly to increase equity in the clinical trials or um, uh, uh, the agents that they're bringing out. So there are more uh, interested part partners for, I mean, interested parties for establishing partnerships. So that could generate another um, funding avenue uh, for these types of cohorts. But my, uh, you know, my pitch to the federal agencies who are possibly listening on this is, I, I possibly cannot imagine how one could do, uh, you know, environmental uh, epidemiological studies or real world studies without the presence of these kinds of cohorts. So I think investing, and, and if you look at the portfolio of grants that come out, uh, the RFPs, you know, there's very little funding for actually doing these types of cohorts. So that's my plug for all the agency participants who might be listening to this. Thank you. Yeah, I can add a few things too. Mm -hmm. um, I, with NYC Haynes and the more recent one in 2013, 14, it, it was very challenging to get funding. And, and Carolyn, you were with us at the time and you, you know the story behind it. Um, but part of the way we, we did get um, a number of foundations to buy into it was kind of with this innovative angle, looking at electronic health record data and using NYC Haynes to validate some of that data and think about how EHR data could be used for population health. Um, so approaches like that that are a little non-traditional can sometimes um, be useful in, in getting people involved and perhaps willing to, to pay for these large-scale data collections, which are really critical um, for understanding what's going on in the health of populations. Uh, with the NYC Health Panel, uh, we were able to get that off the ground because we had COVID-related funding. We had actually been planning that for a number of months, probably four or five minutes before COVID hit. And then, you know, we were lucky to well, unfortunately, there was COVID, but the good, the good side was that there was a lot of money for, for data collection and to respond to COVID, and we, we had the opportunity to get the panel off the ground. And since then, we've had public health infrastructure money, which is also CDC funding, so that's really been critical in, in funding the, the panel on a longer-term basis. Um, so we do have funding probably for another four years. And after that, it's a little bit uncertain, you know, whether the city will take this over or if we'll have other sources of funding. And of course, you know, things change with commissioners and mayoral administrations. So there's a lot of uncertainty often with, with funding of long-term projects. Mm -hmm. um, 
Can I add on and ask about your experience with electronic health records? We struggled with it in the past and are thinking of doing that in the future too. So please tell us how you began and how you overcame some challenges if you had any collecting EHR data. Yeah, um, so at the time there was a system in the health department um, called the Primary Care Information Project, which covered about 2 million people in New York City. Um, it was overseen by another division within the health department. They had done a lot of work to improve data quality and had already set up systems to connect those um, outpatient and hospital providers and to run queries to collect that information. So a lot of that infrastructure was already in place and, and those agreements, and I know those can sometimes be stumbling blocks. Yeah, and one of the big challenges we've seen with EHR is um, that they're not necessarily fully comprehensive of every participant that we have. So, you know, there are some participants that just don't have EHR, so we would miss their data if we only pursue EHR. We tend to actually go after the medical records themselves, so talk to the participants. Um, if it's available by EHR, that makes it cheaper, but uh, we've actually had really good luck with the facilities, just getting the actual medical record, the hard copy medical record. Because like you said, the linkages with EHR, they're great at when it when you get the linkage, but you're probably only going to link somewhere between 40 and 60% of your population, unless you, everybody's <laughs> Medicare eligible. Mm -hmm. Helen? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, very, uh, very good to hear from, from, from all of you. Um, I'm wondering if any of the groups have uh, any experience with public-private partnerships or other sort of collaborative relationships to help with, with, with funding? You've mentioned some, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to draw us out a little bit more on this since it's such an important topic for all of us. Does anyone have I can describe a couple of uh, relationships Google has. As I mentioned the fact that we have the faster CT scanner. That's because our uh, imaging core principal investigator um, has familiarity with GE. I think we had able to use an artificial echo guided uh, ultrasound because this is a new company which is on the block. It's one of the premier companies that's doing this. So we were able to partner with them. Likewise about our mobile lab. So there are multiple levels at which Rural has partnered with uh, making very sure, I think we make very sure to be clear about uh, managing conflicts of interest because we are dealing with economically challenged counties and we need to be explicit. What is it exactly the company is funding and how the data are being handled? So we spend a lot of time. Suzanne, you may want to you know, amplify on that part. Yeah, that's exactly right. The key is with the public-private um, partnership, when you have a private funder, you want to make sure that you are very clear with them um, what their role is and, and what um, what you're willing to allow in terms of the way that they communicate externally about what they're doing, because you don't want to surprise your participants if they all of a sudden see, oh, uh, GE is making money off the rural study, that can destroy a year of community trust. So you, you have to be really, um, you have to make sure the communications are there, that you know what each person's role is. But then just, just like Boston said, we have had some luck, particularly when there is um, you know, like a device, it's been the device world where we've had the most luck with the public-private. Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, these are many, many ideas to think about and, you know, see how we can uh, employ, learn from each other, employ in our own service. We were just wondering about, you know, technological innovations, because we hear a lot about what's NHANES doing new, you know, are we ready for that? And, you know, as I mentioned, we have some constraints, trends to follow. We'd love to hear if any of you are doing any, we're not physical activity monitor, that's pretty standard now, but any other technological innovations, uh, data collection or anything else, other variables or blood tests at home. I know collection was a problem for NYC. What kind of tests, if any, are running? What are you running and how are you succeeding? Anybody can go. Just let us know. We're actually getting ready to deploy two new devices. Um, one is a, a chest monitor to look for, um, look at heart rate variability. It can also detect arrhythmias that people will wear for a week. And we have a, a finger device for pulse oximetry. Those are two mobile um, 
devices that we've deployed. But I would also say when you get that, when you get that question from people, push back just gently. Another thing that we've found is that these types of devices, while they're great and we all think they're going to change the future, they aren't relatively accepted by every population. And if you look at participation rates, you tend to have high participation and high socioeconomic status groups. And you kind of leave out the, the folks that may not have the same level of education or comfort with a new device. So I always gently push back and say, it, uh, technology's great, it's fun, but let's make sure that if we're deploying it, we're deploying it in a way that's equ equitable and that we still get good representation. Susan, I, I have a follow-up question to that. So, you know, one of the things, particularly in Wisconsin, what we have struggled with is some of the rural areas with bandwidth and internet connectivity issues. So, you know, coming in with technological, you know, uh, things on one hand, like you said, you know, helps the economically advantaged population living in the urban areas. But what are your experiences in the true rural areas? A lot exactly what you're talking about. The bandwidth is a real problem. So um, sometimes people even have to go to libraries to sync devices if they don't have a, a strong signal at their home or go to their neighbor's home. Um, you know, we did give everybody a phone for the first six months, but after that, the uh, other studies that have come along and want to, to work with those participants, they, there's just not the bandwidth to do, you know, the rapid, um, the tet, the questionnaires that might come down on the phone, they're not as rapid if you don't have large bandwidth. So that's we definitely push back and say, make sure you understand that this is not, you might not have bandwidth, you might not have um, basic things that we all take for, for granted. The one that we're dealing with right now, the chest patch that I mentioned to you, they sent them to us and they, they're required to have a USB port to be charged. Well, we have participants that don't have USB ports. You know, they don't have blocks. I have blocks all over my office, but they don't have blocks sitting anywhere to charge them. So we also have to send them a charger and the device company was just floored. They didn't, they didn't believe us that people wouldn't have USB chargers lying around everywhere. So it, it's definitely, we see the exact same thing. So if you ever need us to support you in a letter of support, let me know. Thank you. Um, so I, I was hoping to ask about something we touched on a little bit earlier, but to dive a bit deeper. Um, could could anyone talk a little bit about your experience using social media for community engagement and sort of the risks and benefits associated with that? Um, and I open that up to any of our panelists. Yeah, we, we've used it quite a bit, as I've mentioned before. Um, we found it to be very beneficial, the, especially we're with the younger population, which is we're really trying to hit that 25 to 45 year old uh, demographic. They are very social media savvy um, they, and they have ways of getting on social media, even if they don't have phones. Um, we, we do see some kind of transient phone usage um, at different times of the month. And so they might not be on for a couple of weeks, but then might be back on. And we, we actually have had really good luck, even if it doesn't um, reach a person primarily, we even get secondary information. So somebody might say, oh, I heard about this from my daughter. She saw you on Instagram or um, she saw you on Facebook. We're not on all of them. You know, we're not on Snapchat or TikTok. We're, I mean, I'm still, this is very uh, new to me. And, and I think that I'd have to hire a whole new staff of people in their 20s to get on all the social media platforms. But um, we we have used it quite, quite successfully. I, again, the simplest thing that I recommend to everybody, contact Instagram, contact uh, Facebook, talk to them about um, influencers, just purchasing names of influencers. It's fairly inexpensive and they can give you in the Democrat, like in the zip code you're looking for, people who have large numbers of followers. And then you can just reach out um, and say, hi, you know, I'm Suzanne Judd. I work with the Rural Heart and Lung Study. I'd love the opportunity to talk to you about partnering. Um, we compensate you for your time if you'd help us with some messaging. That's just, that's been a huge help. Thank you, Suzanne. You are our local influencer today. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> take that forward. I think Dennis has a question. Yes, hi. Um, we talked a little bit about the private-public kind of partnership. Um, I think in preparation for this webinar, I remember talking to New York City. You were saying that you know there may be some opportunities, or at least you may have had opportunities with being approached by private companies potentially sponsoring certain technologies or uh, parts of your survey. Um, has that 
been successful or has others programs experience that where private companies are approaching you to potentially um, engage in some of these survey activities? Um, we we did have discussions with Quest Diagnostics. Uh, someone on our team had a connection there and um, it, you know, they were very willing to talk to us and support the study on a pro bono basis, which was kind of amazing. And we had um, pretty in-depth discussions and ultimately decided that it just wouldn't really work for logistical reasons, but um, it's definitely worth exploring possibilities like that. And I, private companies may be more open to it than we might think. Dennis, you have a follow-up comment or question? Yeah, just wondering if other survey programs have been approached by other uh, private entities. So we have, have been approached by companies about leveraging the data and samples. And we are, you know, right now in discussions. So, you know, I can't talk about the specifics, but uh, we are seeing an increasing number of uh, companies getting interested in the data. But again, we have to be careful about what kind of data can be provided, you know, what's the implication on uh, the participant, uh, you know, and, and because we had been always uh, disclosing the study results, et cetera, uh, whenever possible. So we want to continue that. So those are some of the mm -hmm. terms that we will want to include in our uh, relationships. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for those remarks. Uh, Caroline, any concluding remarks from you? No, thank you. This has been a very engaging uh, panel discussion, and we really appreciate um, all of your, your input and advice and sharing your uh, experiences with us. Thank you. And I think I've noted down many, many pointers. I believe we are going to come back to you, all of you, to get more in-depth information <laughs> after this call and please the same for attendees as well as you guys the presenters reach out to us for with your thoughts comments anytime we would welcome that with that i think we are going to come to our closure here and i have the privilege to wrap up this session and thank everybody really for everybody who stayed through the end of the program and just been a wonderful experience learning from each other. And let's stay engaged and keep talking to each other. Okay, first of all, I would like to give a very, very big thanks to our invited presenters because they have not only shared their experience and time today, but really they've been involved with us for several months in planning this webinar. So we thank you for your patience and being there today, sharing your experience with all of us. And Dennis and I would also like to thank all the staff at NCHS in the Office of Center Director at in our own division who really helped us plan and conduct today's webinar, making it, we believe, a successful event. Thank you so much. Now, we hope this webinar has provided ideas for follow-up to everyone who's listening and how we can all improve our programs and, and increase our outreach. Next slide. Uh, a recording of the webinar will be posted on the NCHS website. A question had come up whether we would be sharing the slides. We would share a recording of the webinar. So please stay tuned for that. And then, of course, I'm going to give a big shout out to Dennis Lowe for being the co-presenter, co-host, everything. Really couldn't do this without you. He's been the backbone for this webinar. And all the folks present here in the room from representing different divisions, OIS, OPEBLE, short forms will do, OIT, and Caroline from OD. Thank you so much for really being here and making this um, a, a real event. We were worried about it with the shutdown, but I'm sh glad we were able to pull it through with this uncertain times anyhow. Now, please feel free to reach out to any of us, Dennis, myself, and any presenters, and let's keep the dialogue going. Thank you to everyone for participating in today's webinar and have a great rest of the afternoon.